All right, please take your Bible this morning, and I'd like for you to stand and turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and I want to call your attention to the first four verses in that chapter. Luke chapter 16, begin, we'll begin reading this morning at verse number 1. And he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Key verse. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship I cannot dig. To beg, I am ashamed. And then verse number 4, I am resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, there may I receive me into their houses. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. Brother Bobby Adams, would you pray for the message this morning that I'd like for everybody to be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you, Lord, for the, the service, the singing. And the, yes, we Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to be here. Yes, and Lord. We just thank you for what we've heard. And pray, Father, to, um, to help us always to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so, Father, now as we come to the preaching of your word, we pray for our pastor. We pray, Father, to lift him up. And, Father, just use him. And we pray, Father, what you've laid on his heart and what he's prepared and studied. We Please help that, that we'll be able to receive it and apply it to our lives. We thank Please, you for yes. our Savior. We thank you for the cross. We thank yes. you for redemption through the blood. Yes. We thank you for his soon return. We love you, praise you, and thank you for thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I'm going to preach a very <laughs> different type of message than I am accustomed to preaching. First, this message is actually another man's message. Actually, it's, it's another man's closing prayer to a message. And second, the text we have just read is about the unjust steward. And I am not preaching on the unjust steward this morning. But what I do want you to notice is that the unjust steward's response I want you to notice his response after he is accused by his master of wasting his goods. His master is getting ready to terminate his employment. That's how they say it in human resources. We would say he's fixing to get fired. And the Bible tells us in verse number 3, this is what he does now, setting up the message. The Bible tells us in verse number 3 that he questions himself. And the question is, what shall I do? I'm fixing to be in trouble here. I'm fixing to lose my job. And then in verse number 4, he answers himself, I am resolved what to do. It's all right to talk to yourself and to answer yourself, as long as you know it's yourself doing the talking and answering. Now, church, listen to me. Sometimes one of the best things we can do is just sit down and examine and scrutinize and question ourselves rather than, than examine and scrutinize or question somebody else. So here is how I got the message for this morning. As most of you know, Dr. Charles Stanley, the longtime pastor of First Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, just recently passed away at the age of 90. Dr. Stanley, we know, for as long as I ever watched him preach, he preached out of the New American Standard. We don't believe that in that. He certainly was not as dispensational as many of us here are here this morning, that's for sure. We all understand that. However, Charles Stanley was a great preacher. And when he died, he died uncompromisingly preaching the gospel and the truths of the Bible. And Charles Stanley stayed true to the Lord through his, though his wife 
left him many years ago. And his son Andy Stanley went off the deep end theologically. Charles Stanley, I'm just going to tell you, has been, a, like I said, we don't line up with everything. I got you. I know, I know. But Charles Stanley's been a great help to me in my life. And if you don't like Charles Stanley this morning, I just really don't care. Amen. Because I like him. He made a lot of good quotes and he preached a lot of good messages. And, um, and some of them were very instrumental in helping me. Whatever his problems were. And by the way, if we're going to be critical of preachers, and I guess you should. You need, you need to watch out for preachers. Let's just make sure we get all of our problems too because we all got them. Amen? Amen? We all got them. Now since he passed away, they have been putting several short clips from his messages on social media. And one of the clips is of Dr. Stanley praying at the end of a message. And in that prayer, he mentions six questions, or rather he prayed these six questions that are to be answered of himself and his congregation. And what I want us to do this morning is to address these same questions for ourselves. So the title of my message this morning is this, Answers to Know Before You Go. And before you go, I'm not talking about leaving this church, I'm talking about leaving this life. It's answers to know before you go. And the very first question when Charles Stanley is standing there and he's praying at the end of his message, the very first question deals with how somebody might live their life right now, but then it helps to answer the remaining five questions that he's standing there praying about and asking the Lord and making personal application in his life and to his congregation, the remaining five questions which are about how you and I are going to die. Listen, how... We live, and answer the question about how we live is going to determine the, how we answer the questions about how we die. So here's what Charles Stanley prayed as he was ending that message so many years ago. The message, answers to know before you go. Number one, the first thing he said when he was standing there bowing his head and praying, Charles Stanley said this, he said, Lord, Asking on behalf of his church, Lord, what am I living for? You ever just stop and ask yourself that question? Lord God, why am I living? What am I living for? Revelation chapter 4 verse number 11 says that all things were created by God and they were created for his pleasure. And we need to understand why did God put us here on this earth? So many of us live for ourselves, don't we? You ever seen that acronym, JOY? You want to have joy in your life, you know what that is? It's Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Colossians chapter 3 verse number 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, it didn't say he gave us eternal life, and he did, but Christ is our life. What are you living for? I think of an old song in the hymnal here. Written by a fellow that was born in 1866. Living for Jesus. When I ask you the question, what are you living for? The song goes like this. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please Him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessings for me. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou and Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own... No other master, my heart shall be thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Do you feel that way this morning? Ask yourself this morning, why am I on this mud ball? And what am I living for? What's driving me to get up every morning? What's motivating me to go through the daily routine every morning? Ask yourself, Lord, what am I living for? Because how you answer that question is going to answer the remaining five that he asked in that prayer. Because listen to me, folks. What you and I live for is going to determine what we die for. It's going to be carried into the next life. And every once in a while, we just need to stand back and ask ourselves, what am I living for? 
What's my purpose? Why did God put me on this earth? Why am I still breathing air while others, many have passed away during my life that I know, some younger than me, some older than me, some people I grew up with, some people I'm kin to. <clears throat> why, did, why is God not taking me? Why am I still here? It's not just to suck up the oxygen out of the atmosphere. It's to do something for him. It's to live for him. Number two, the next question, he, he, he bowed his head and he said this. He said, Lord, what am I leaving behind? What am I leaving behind? Lord, what am I living for? And number two, Lord, what am I leaving behind? You ever think about what you're leaving behind? And some people might say, yeah, I, I know what I'm leaving behind. I'm leaving some money behind. I'm leaving some land behind. I'm, I'm leaving some uh, precious family relics and heirlooms behind. Okay, is that all that you're leaving behind? You ever think about leaving a spiritual legacy behind? You ever think about leaving some saved children behind? Some saved grandchildren, some saved great-grandchildren? How about a spiritual inheritance? We get so focused on what we want to leave our children. And listen, there's nothing wrong with it. The Bible talks about a father's father leaves his uh, grandchildren an inheritance. And, and I believe in all that. I believe it's good if you can leave your children something. I believe it's good if you can work hard for them and do something for them. I'm not against that. I, I, I'm not against those kind of things. I believe in keeping tracks of land in your family. It's becoming more and more important to have a little bit of land. We might all have to get back to it one day. I'm all for that. But church, what good have you done if you leave your children all the money and all the things, and I pass down this, this gun's been in my family for, for 75 and 80 years, and I pass that down. You pass all that, and you leave all that money and all that material and all that land and everything, but you don't leave any knowledge to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. They never heard you pray. They never saw you read the Bible. You never took them to church. You, you, they're not saved. And you can leave this earth broke and unable to leave your children anything but you are able everybody in here is able to leave them with the most important thing that's a godly testimony and a spiritual legacy when you and I die is anybody going to remember back to when grandma prayed for me and I remember when I went to Uncle So and So, and he helped me, and he prayed for me, and he led me, my daddy led me to the Lord, and they used to come by and pick me up to take me to church. Maybe I know we have some bus people that's grown up that were bus kids that were taken to church on the bus and got saved, and and you can you have testimony, and maybe some of those people that come in the community and picked you up on the bus are dead and gone now. And you're here saved this morning doing something for the Lord because they left something. They left something behind spiritually. Folks, we got we to gotta answer the question first. What are we living for in order to answer the rest of these questions? What are we going to leave when we die? Because we are dying. And unless the Lord comes back, every one of us is going to die. So number three, this was the third question he asked. First he said, Lord, what am I living for? Then he said, number two, Lord, what am I leaving behind? Then he said this in his prayer. He said, number three, Lord, what difference will I have made? And I can assure you, Dr. Charles Stanley was not talking about what difference he made in the climate. And plugging up the ozone layer. And worried about aerosol cans. Let me tell you something. You, anybody watching you, bunch of tree huggers and climatologists and all that, God's going to burn the whole thing up one day. And all your junk with it. Zoom in on that, sister. I said all you tree huggers and people that love nature and love the world and so worried about spending billions on the greenhouse effect. Look at this. God's going to burn it all up one day. And all of God's people said, Amen. 
It's not political reform. Listen, what's going to save this country is, has nothing to do with the stinking White House. That's the outhouse. Anything that happens of spiritual significance will start in the church house. But it's shot too. It's not some kind of great humanitarian accomplishments. And that's good. We should try to do something to ease the suffering of others. I am all for easing the suffering of others. But what good does it do if I grow crops in a foreign land? And you should. They should be able to eat just like me. Or give them good clean drinking water. And you should. They should be able to drink water just like us. But what good if I do all that and they still die and go to hell? Does no good. I'm not talking about scientific discoveries and inventions. Ask yourself this. What kind of difference will I have made for the kingdom of God? That's it. But what kind of, what, what kind of difference will I have made in somebody's family? In somebody's local church? My local church? In a neighborhood? In a school, in my home, in the workplace. You know what I believe? I believe that you and I cannot really tell the value of a man or a woman until they're absent. You and I cannot really tell. Maybe it's, maybe it's that we just take them for granted when they're alive. Maybe we don't focus on them like we should. Maybe we take, we take them for granted. We don't think about the day they'll not be here. But listen. When somebody is gone and they used to be a part of your life, then you can tell how much they contributed. Then you can tell what kind of significance it was to have them around. And we've got some preachers that are gone now. I sure do miss them. We've got some people that love the Lord and were real good. And you can tell, listen, you can tell that they left a spiritual legacy and a spiritual uh, stamp on this world because now we miss them when they're gone. And we yearn for the days when they were here and we could maybe talk to them and have them pray with us. And we remember things they taught us and things they preached to us and how they helped us. One day, one day they're going to be coming by and looking at you and I. They're going to put us to bed with a shovel. And they're going to roll us up here first before they do. Everybody's going to go around and look and... Look in the casket. And unfortunately for most people that die, there'll be a bunch of lying, one or at least one or two or three maybe, ever how many they get involved in the service, lying preachers. It's amazing to me when somebody dies, it don't matter what kind of rascal he was when he was alive, he's just the greatest person that ever lived. I just, I just hope to God... I just hope to God that somebody will come by one day and look in the casket and under their breath, under their breath in the line of all the people coming up there and say, thank you, Lord, for how you used Brother Dennis to help me. Thank you, Lord, for giving Brother Dennis that message. Thank you, Lord, for giving Brother Dennis that wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for giving Brother Dennis the time he come and see me in the hospital. And I was real depressed and real down or the time he prayed with me. Or with Thank you, Lord, for Brother Dennis just being there, just being my friend. Not just my pastor, but he was my friend. I hope that somebody will say something like that in the midst of all the other. It might be, thank you, Lord, for taking them as soon as you did. I mean, never can tell. What difference will I have made? Question number four. This is the fourth thing Charles Stanley asked. He said, Lord, what am I living for? Then he said, Lord, what am I going to leave behind? And then he said, Lord, what kind of difference will I have made when I leave here? And then he's praying and he said this. He said, Lord, how can my good works continue? How can my good works continue? You know, that's a good question. Now, when he was praying that, Dr. Stanley has his in-touch ministries that continue. I was thinking about Dr. Ruttman that's been gone for these years now, all the messages and books and, and sermons and all the pastors he tips and all the things. I mean, at, long after he's dead and gone, he's still ministering to people. I, still, I think about uh, Dr. Oliver B. Green. Dr. Oliver, Oliver B. Green was concerned. He didn't think he was going to live very long, and that was, he was right about that. And he, he was uh, interested in getting his stuff up and taped and 
and having it out. And I tell you right now, many times now when I'm traveling through different parts of the country, going to preach, they're still playing Oliver B. Green on the radio. How many of you ever have ever heard him in the last year on the radio? Anybody, anybody listen to him on the radio much? Boy, if you ain't listened to Oliver B. Green in a while, you're missing something. He was a great preacher. This is Oliver B. Green from Greenville, South Carolina. Was that pretty good, Brother Bobby? He was being generous to me. Boy, he was a good preacher. Oliver B. Green died at 61 in 1976. But his works continue. On all these little radio stations all over the world. What spiritual contributions did you make? Ask yourself this. What con spiritual contributions will you have made while you were alive that will continue to bear fruit once you are dead? That's a good question, ain't it? Do you think about that? What did you do while you were alive that's going to continue to make contributions and a difference long after you and I are dead. You need to think about this. Point number five. This is a, two more. It's the last two things he prayed. He prayed this. He said, Lord, what can I give to continue the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's a pretty good prayer. Now we think about three things. We think about the tithe, time, and talents and I don't necessarily like to use the word tithe. I think the New Testament teaches something besides a tithe. But however you want to do it, your money, your time, your talents, those are things that I can give right now, that long after I'm dead and gone, will continue the proclamation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 16 says, Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. We are to make the most of our time. You and I have limited time. I talked to you about that Wednesday night. We have limited time. What are we going to do with it? You can witness to people. You can pass out tracts. You can give them cards. I know people don't write cards much anymore, but it's still a good ministry. Text them. Hope, put signs out. Whatever you can do, do something. Listen, do something that's going to keep on going after the grave. You need to think about that. This is, this is maybe what you want to do. You ever thought about leaving some money to an organization that gets the gospel out? When you die, instead of leaving everything to your children, this is going to go over real good, I'm sure. Maybe you just want to pray. Maybe you just want to pray about leaving a portion of your money to a local church or to a mission board or to a printing press. Something that's going to help get the gospel out after you're dead and gone. Do you know what Charles, Dr. Charles Stanley was doing in that prayer after he, he, he got through preaching and he was praying? And listen, this was, he was, you could look at him and tell in the video he was already older. But it was many, many years ago. He didn't die until he was 90. Several, several years ago when, I watched, when this video came out. But he was already concerned about the day that he knew was going to come in his life that came the other week. And he was reflecting. He was saying, you know, when I am dead and gone, what am I going to be left behind? Do you know what bothers me? i tell you what bothers me, and it ought to bother you, and I want you to listen to me very carefully. For me, one of the things that irritates me or troubles me is this, church. I think it is a terrible, miserable life to live your life up for yourself. The older I get, the more I pray about every single selfish tendency that I have. And I have some. You know what I pray? I pray sometimes. I say, Lord, if it's your will and you want me to be this way, I know you don't mind me having pleasure and doing stuff. I said, but if it's your will... I would like for you to make me, or not make me, but work in my heart where there's nothing that matters to me and I don't want to do anything but something for you. The older I get, I think about it, 
And I say, and it scares me. It scares me as I get closer to death. It scares me. It scares me that I don't want to die and just stuff my gut and pull down the shades and took care of me and my own and never live for somebody else besides myself. That is a terrible way to die. That is so unlike the Savior. He came and he lived for everybody else but himself. He lived for his father and for people. He always put himself last. He was the greatest example of a leader while being a servant. The Lord Jesus Christ of anybody you'll ever read about. Folks, if I've come and lived my life and I've passed away and went off the scene and I've never helped anybody else or made a difference in anybody else's life, I have died a failure. And that scares me to think that I would just come and live and suck up the air every how many years God gives me. And all I ever thought about was myself. And I advanced my bank account for me. And I got the jobs for me. And I got the power for me. And I did the things for me. And everything was about me, 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 and die that way. Leaving nothing for somebody else. Some of you are like me. You're getting closer and closer to that time. And you better be thinking about that. <clears throat> and finally, the last question. Whose eternal destiny will have been changed because of how I lived and because of how I gave? That was the last question he asked in his closing prayer to that message. He said, Lord, whose eternal destiny will have been changed because of how I lived and because of how I gave? I think about that song, Thank You, Lord, for giving to the Lord. I am a life that has changed. That's a good song. You know, I can, cannot for the life of me understand a stingy Christian. That's an oxymoron to me. May just take the oxy off of it and call him a moron. I can't, I can't understand that there's any such thing as a, a stingy Christian. And we ought to give not just our money, that's certainly part of it, but not just our money. There's all kind of things we can give of ourselves to everybody else and most importantly to the Lord. But ask yourself this question, is anybody going to be in heaven because of what you gave? I know the Lord does the saving. I know it's all up to Him. I know that. But is anybody going to be up there one day? Or do you even have a halfway chance of getting the soul winner's crown? I don't know who, who all God's going to give the soul winner's crown to or not. But I believe there's a man in our church going to get it. I believe Brother Dan Daniel's going to get it. If he don't get it, ain't none of us going to get it. So <laughs> just for don't even think, don't even look for it. Just everybody step behind Brother Dan. If they say, Brother Dan, you don't get it, then everybody just walk out of the line. You ain't getting him. Is anybody going to go to heaven because of a track that you bought or a group of tracks or money you put in the plate or a witness or a card you wrote, an email, a text or something? Is anybody going to be influenced because of you when you were on the earth? Is anybody going to be heaven or live a life pleasing to Jesus Christ because of the example that you live before them? Folks, that was so many years ago when Charles Stanley did that. If I'm looking at the furniture in the back of that video, it looked like to me they were still in the old sanctuary when he was preaching that. And what that would mean is probably when he preached that, he had no idea about YouTube <laughs> and Facebook, and social media. But he's just standing up there saying, as we pray, Lord, is there anything anybody going to get saved long after I'm dead and gone because of something I do? The answer to that, Charles Stanley, is yes. Yes. Church, 
these are, these are things, as I close, to know before you go. Before you and I go, as the British say, pop off, buy the farm, however you want to say it, leave this world. There are some things that you need to know before you go. If you're saved, hallelujah, that's the most important thing. If somebody's here today and you're not saved, you need to be saved. You need to trust Christ today before you leave. Now listen, now listen as we close the message, please don't lose me now. We say this often around here, and many Bible believers say this little poem. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Don't we say that often? Well, if you really believe that, then ask yourself this question. How much of what I've done in my life is going to last? Do you see what we just said? Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Okay then. If that's the truth, how much is going to be there when it's over? How much have you done for Christ? To me, one of the saddest things, again, is to think about living a life that never touches anyone else's life. Listen, living a self-centered, lavish life is foreign to New Testament Christianity. I want to I be used up for Jesus Christ, and I want to be used up for others. I want to have the same testimony Paul did in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, where he said, I will very gladly spent and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. I'm going to leave this world one day, folks. And when I leave, I want to leave with everyone knowing that Jesus Christ was the most important thing in my life. And I want others who are still in the land of the living to be better off in the next world because of the connection they made with me in this world. And church, one final thing I'll say. I want you to, again, think about these six questions that Dr. Stanley put to his congregation so many years ago because I really believe they are answers that you and I need to know before we go. And what's going to happen after we go is what we know. All right, every head bow and eye close. Every head bow and eye close.